unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Paul tells you we shall be judged by the law that set us free. Not the law that bound us. Okay? But you know that the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, like uh, Moses says, it says, and these commandments were laid against you. They were set against you this day. Okay? The Bible says that the law was added for transgression. You understand? The Bible tells you that the law was given to prove all men guilty. You understand where I'm coming from? But God is not seeking to even judge men in the law. He seeks to judge men in what set them free. So our, in our liberties is the judgment. Our judgments are not in our limitations. Our judgments are not in what we could not do. Our judgments are in what we could do. You understand? And because our judgments are in the liberties, and our liberties are in knowledge, you understand? We realize that true freedom and deliverance comes when a man knows. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It doesn't matter what could be or what is done. If truth is not established, you cannot be free. And whether the sun sets free, is free indeed. And who is his son? The white. He becomes flesh, dwells among men. We behold his only glory as the truly true son of God, full of grace and truth. But now prophecy is being fulfilled before our very own eyes. It says that in the last days men's ears shall grow grossly waxed, that they shall be dull of hearing. And that is why when it comes to the church at Corinth, he says, for there are many things I needed to share with you, but I realized that you are not able to bear the insights. And the Greek language used that for the bearing of the word. You could not bear them. The word bearing them was carrying them. There are certain men's spirits that cannot carry revelation to a certain level. Because the tenacity of this revelation also comes with a demand and need of commitment by the spirit or in the spirit it demands men to be realigned to particular laws in eternity you understand and so it kills all these traditional assemblings that we have on the earth which we call the wives which we call the gospel which we call the doctrine it kills out all this happening life and pretense that the christian church has today that place where a man will be satisfied to find a man at the temple called beautiful but because he has nothing you will give him coins and they're satisfied to give those coins and walk away. You understand? But there's a reason as to why your Peter could not pass that man. Or there's a reason as to why when he turns to that man, he has faith that that man will walk. But sometimes in church, it's not that the men are not walking, the lame or the blind are not seeing. Sometimes it's the indifference of Christians to the things that ought to be pertaining the gospel that we have, we've attained. Those things that we ought to have shown full proof of what we have been given, so to speak. You understand? And how then you sit in that life where you live a normal Christian life, a normal life of prayer, a normal life of fasting, a normal life of loving brethren, and a normal that at the end of the day you were as predictable. The only difference is you sat and the Muslim put his head down. But there was no difference between the two of you. Because what you could do, the Muslim could do. Where is the peculiar people? The chosen generation, the royal priesthood. You get where I'm coming from? So we realize this one thing, that if truth is not preached, men cannot walk free. Men cannot walk as they should walk. You understand where I'm coming from? If you preach the truth, men will live the truth. If you preach the lie, men will not live. You understand? That's why the Bible says he's Paul, a bond apostle to Christ, by the acknowledgement of a truth that tends to godliness, toward God's elect. When God finds the elect, he only gives us a truth that will manifest the mystery of godliness. And what is the mystery of godliness? He came in the flesh, he was vindicated by the spirit, he was seen by the angels, he was preached on the world, the world believed on him, and he ascended in glory. Many people miss that the moment you became born again, and this Jesus becomes flesh, you understand? Because this is the mystery that was hit from the ages, Pastor now revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You understand? But when this Jesus gets inside you, 
whether you want it or not, you become a new creature. In him you live, in him you move, and in him you have your own being. You're no longer a human being. You become a Christ being. And because you become a Christ being, the next line of the spirit of godliness comes in. You are vindicated by the spirit. You are justified by the spirit. The spirit proves you true. You understand? That satisfaction that every Christian must be proved by the Spirit. You shouldn't be proved by arguing out. You shouldn't be proved by fighting. You shouldn't be proved by doing what men in the flesh can do. You should be proved by the Spirit. Because that's what makes us godly. There is an extra thing on us. Are you hearing me? But these things have started to die out and have died out over the years. And then we realize that many of time, many of the things that have been taught in the Church of Christ today have been misunderstood. For example, the doctrine of grace and the law. Many men either have misunderstood it or for some who try to give the balance of that inclined back to the law and they don't even know what they're doing. If you can understand Paul's ministry, clear cut in black and white, okay, and you understand grace, everything else will come because Jesus Christ is grace and grace is the person of Jesus. Are we together? So we begin with Paul, the apostle, born in Tarsus, the city of Cilicia, a son of a Pharisee, raised there. At a particular age, while he's still a young man, because of the zeal of his fathers, he crosses over to Jerusalem, sits under a celebrity called Gamaliel, who is considered one of the best teachers of the law. But we realize that while this man is present, he had adopted the Hellenistic culture of the Greek people. And Hellenism and Judaism always exchanged a lot because the Israelites were subject to the Greek. You understand? And so the ideas of the Plato, the Alexander, all these guys of things, they're all looking for this one thing, Platonism, they're all looking for this one thing. It doesn't matter whichever way, just put them in an institution where you can control them. It doesn't matter if they can shout a lot, let them be under your control. It doesn't matter whether they can scream a lot, let them be under your control. Constantin uses the same method. All they want to do is, they'll create a line of cosmopolitanism, they'll create a line of their language, they'll create a line of their philosophies, they'll create a line of anything, their schools of thought, their doctrines will be incorporated, that Christianity will have a certain kind of, not only Christianity, but a few dogmas, a few occultic lines that also are joined together for what men call Christianity today. You get where I'm coming from? And then... You realize that as Judaism influenced Hellenism, Hellenism also influenced Judaism. And for some of you, I even read for you the Judaistic creed, such that you know how the Judaists believe. And I showed you very clearly in their creed that they don't even believe Jesus Christ is come yet. And because they don't believe, they realize and affirm that their greatest prophet is Moses. And no other prophet is wiser, or oh, has come, or shall come before that, or oh, after that. The greatest of them must be Moses. If any other come, let them come, but Moses takes the preeminence and the superiority in the Judistic point of view. You understand? And you realize that some people like Islam and many other schools of thought, you realize they have borrowed that. Some have maintained the line of believing in Christ, but they have also entertained the doctrine of Moses. So Moses still has a place, even where Jesus is. So the contention here is Jesus and Moses, who is greater? Also to speak, even men who are ignorant and are just told things that they can't be as far as the Bereans, for they do not argue and contend, but the Bible says, but they go out and search out these scriptures to know if they are so. And we're living in a time where men don't read the Bible. They, it's read for them. It's read on Sunday. It's read on Tuesday. They read the newspapers. They read notes. They read everything. They read their research papers. They have notes and they're all tucked up in, the, in everything. But the spirit of the world has consumed them enough to give them time for everything but not the gospel. And yet one day, all these things that we aspire for, even though they are wonderful, Paul knows how to make tents, but God is not going to ask him about how good he was at the tent. Paul will ask, God will ask Paul of a course. You understand? And I was sharing with certain, a certain group of people and Christians. And I told them that if you never understand the kingdom idea, the kingdom mindset, the kingdom mind, the mind of God concerning his kingdom, you will not understand that God's idea of kingdom has not been a set line of rules and principles for you to follow like the men of the world produce kingdom. In fact, God's concept of kingship does not connect with the earth. When men think and say we want a king, he gives them a king. They put their own order and line of how to treat kings. But that's God, not God's concept. He didn't even want to give them kings in the first place. You get where I'm coming from? But if you read the Greek language, you realize that the word kingdom is actually realm. God does not want to introduce you into a certain crammed line of 
thought of what a kingdom should look like after the pattern of Yobuganda king or any other king across the world. But he wants to take it to a place where a kingdom would represent realm. You understand? Where you have a representation in that realm. Where you function in power in that realm. And now that you've been made priests and kings to the Most High God, that you represent something in that line of the king. That we function in the realm of the king as kings. Praise the Lord Jesus. That's why the Bible says that the kingdom of God is likened unto a man who finds a treasure in a field. But the Bible says when he finds this treasure in the field hid, he doesn't hide it and then go away with it. The Bible says he puts it back, hides it deeper. God sells everything he has and comes to buy the field. Because the concept is he has understood the principle of what it is to possess treasure with the ranks. If you don't have ranks with your treasure, it doesn't matter how anointed you are, you never run courses. So when Paul says, I have run my race, I've finished my course, and now I'm looking for this whole crown of righteousness that shall be bestowed unto me as a Christian, what is your course? What is your course? You're just this choir guy that sits every Sunday and sings. What is your course? You're just that brother who went to Bible school and crammed a few phrases and you can share. But what is your course? If you can go back to the lines of your course, how much accountability do you have to the Spirit if you're realigning yourself to the wisdoms of divine purpose? Because there is this excitement that can precede many Christians to go out and reach out with, Oh, I'm excited, I love Jesus. We go and give these orphans, you can love these parents and these prisoners in prison and everything. But when Paul tells you, I am accountable of no man's blood, it means even in the course, the number of men he had to reach was there. That is why he just goes beyond the side of a man apostle to the seeking to apprehend that which Christ apprehended him for. Philippians 3.12. He says, yes, I'm anointed and I can make the lamb walk. But how many men are supposed to sit under here? Because that's the concept of the field. The field are the people. If the treasure is not for the people, it's not useful. You're not anointed for yourself. You're anointed for people. You're not filled for yourself. You're filled for people. You're not consecrated for yourself. You're consecrated for people. But we cannot create a line of Christianity where Christians are just selfish. It's me and my wife and my children and my DVD player thing and everything around me and my car and my mobile phone. Let me tell you, you cannot be born again and you don't lay down your life for the sake of the brethren. But today there is a line of Christianity. I don't understand where it came from, but it is there. And that is why soon I'm going to give you a teaching of First Peter, why he tells you that make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. I want to show you why certain people fall. And now you realize that 99% of the people who fall out in church, they were here, they were excited, they got slain in the power of the Holy Ghost, they prophesied, but over time they left and they're in the world. Look at their lives. Many of those men never made their calling and election sure. They were just seated. They were not planted in the house of the Lord. Because if you're planted, the Bible says in, in Psalms, you shall flourish. You won't fall. But there's a reason as to why Christians fall. And sometimes they don't fall because they have their grandmother's demon. No, 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 no. They don't understand why Paul feels at Damascus. The first thing he does, in no wasted of time, he enters the gospel. Because if you understand the doctrine, you are perfected in the works of the gospel. And if you are perfected, you will not be as babes who are tossed to and fro by all words of doctrine. And when they're tossed by all words of doctrine, they have loose spirits in the spirit world. You understand? Again, I get to come today. Musuma gundi ayabika. Boom. Now again. Gundi alagula. Boom. Gundi. That this pastor, he heals. This guy, this guy, he prophesies. This guy, he prays for the sick. They're, they're restless. To them, every church is a church. And every prayer place is a prayer place. That's why he tells Timothy, knowing from whom you learn from. Meaning every man can teach you, but you don't learn from every man. You must have imitations in the spirit. Because you must produce a particular kind. Your calling and election must be sure. There is no Christian that is not called. And there is no Christian that is not elected. And there is no Christian without a race. And there is no Christian without a course. And I'm not talking about raising kids driving a car, doing a very good job in Ministry of Foreign Affairs and having a very nice job in the army or serving your country and paying your taxes. We are all obliged to that. Peter did. But he became more. He became more than that. And for such things, this dull thing, it's a lethargic spirit. It has killed the line of men being zealous for the right thing. You understand? But we cannot raise a generation like that. We cannot. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, these people have seen men on, on the internet. They're debating over who is right and who is wrong. And I realize, I told people, that many of these men don't pray. They don't pray. There are certain things a praying man can't say. 
I'm telling you, there are certain things a man who prays can't say. But they've left the place of the presence and they're going out in social media every day. Apostle Wun is a cult, Pastor Wun is a cult, Benny Hinn is a cult, Bill is a cult, Bill is a cult, Andrew Mack is a cult. We are warning you. For us, the Lord anointed us to warn. When I was a ministry, I sought nothing save Christ dead and resurrected. You think Jesus could not have preached a sermon on Pharisees? You realize he just used to rebuke Pharisees, but not make them a sermon. Because that's another thing. He has a bigger picture. He has a cup to carry that a Pharisee won't know. Even the high priest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why he says, do all things to mind your own business in this life. To work with your own hands that you might have a testimony among them that are without. We've never stood on this pulpit and preached men. Never. Because there's too much. Too much. For me now to get a certain man of God and start to read him. God forbid. We're perfecting saints for the work of ministry. To the edification of the body. Until they might come to the full measure and stature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're reproducing after a kind of man. Where you reach and realize this man is Jesus. No. He's not informed about every cult in the country. No. He's Jesus. And how horribly these men have looked in the eyes of the men that called cults. Because these men's ministries have continued to increase and their own are destroyed. Come on, don't you think there is something? Go to the closet and get enough anointing for men to see you. Because you can fake anything but you can't fake the anointing. You can fake anything but you can't fake favor. You can't fake favor. If a man is favored, you can fight and fight and fight. But you're wasting time. Why? Because the lesser or is criticized as the greater. You know what I'm telling you? We never want to hear any church member get involved in fights with other men outside ministry. Mind your business. Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. It doesn't matter how sentimental it is. You preach Christ because that's the anointing. He says he has anointed us for the spirit and not the letter. If he has not anointed me for the letter, who am I to start gauging men and weighing them in the letter? Yet we regard no man in the flesh. Tell him I've understood. Tell him I've understood. So Paul has a Judistic line. He has a Hellenistic line. He tells you, brethren, you know of my former past conversation. Of how I persecuted the church of Christ and spoiled it. You know of the zeal that I carried of my fathers. Of how I beheld the doctrine. Of the what? Of the Judaism or Judistic doctrine. Paul could heal for the gospel because he understood the Judistic. Okay? Jesus blinds him on his way to Macedonia, Damascus. He gets to Damascus, and then he has opened his eyes. And after then he has opening his eyes, he tells him, Now you're going to know the price of what it means to follow Christ. He's in Damascus serving the Lord, doing his own business. And one time the Lord tells him, There's a message I want to put in your spirit. And he says, when the message came, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither to them that were apostles before me in Jerusalem. But I went to Arabia. You understand? So God separates this man. And that's why they don't understand the chronicles and lines. The true lines of God trusting a man with instruction. That is why in the book of Psalms, Revelation stops to be what the man told you on Sunday. Or what he shared in the Bible. Or what excited. You understand? Revelation starts to be the thing you found when the word was spoken. You understand? Because life we speak to many men, not men many find. But that's why he says, I rejoice at thy word. Like a, like a man that has found spoil, that has found spoil. Because there are places in the Holy Spirit where we have to stumble on Revelation. We have to find it in there. For it is the glory of a king to search out the matter. We go in the spirit realm and start to seek for this person it becomes deeper than oh my pastor said blue therefore it's going to be blue no he could say blue but as he spoke blue pink 
straight in your spirit. I don't know why you understand what I'm telling you. That's why the word of God is supple and a double-edged sword cuts asunder, separates the bone and marrow. Our business is very simple. It cuts asunder. You understand? It doesn't connect. It, uh, yeah. it doesn't connect Luke and Matthew, no. It cuts Matthew and you find Luke. It cuts Luke and you enter Malachi. It cuts Malachi and you find Jeremiah. It gets inside Jeremiah and throws you to Titus. You get what I'm trying to tell you? We cut through. We don't connect. Because I can connect and kill you. And Judas hung himself. And then I connect another line. In Jesus' precept. God do likewise. And some men are connected. They are not accurately dividing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So revelation starts to be a place where you no, it goes beyond the notes you're writing. Because you're not speaking from your mind what the Lord spoke to you. You're speaking from your spirit because he functions to preach by Rema. The graces of Rema is very clear. Rema functions with the convictions of divine purpose. Not a personal conviction. Another thing I fail to understand with men of God. What personally convicts is what he makes his message. Maybe he has not been praying a lot. He generalizes, brethren, we have not been praying a lot. We never seek the Lord. I mean, you have not been praying. And you think because you have not been praying. Brother Robert has also not been praying. So that's why when we get to places where now men stumble, to eye has not seen, ear has not heard, has not entered the hearts of men. Are you hearing me? What the Lord has prepared. And then he says, advancedly, he has revealed, not progressively revealed. He has a pignos. Are you hearing me? Perfect knowledge. Eye has not seen it, ear has not heard it, has not entered the hearts of men. That which he has prepared for them that love him. And he says, but he has revealed it unto us by his spirit. So we start to carry a revelation. Finished. That our hearts in that is a good matter. Concerning the things that the king has done. And our mouths are like a pen of a ready writer. You understand? Yes. We're speaking as spirits of the land men, not learning. We are not in a progressive line of adoptation. Why? Because the first finding of revelation is when a man meets the true apprehensions of epignosis. Because epignosis is the advanced knowledge, complete, perfect, that the new man puts on when you get born again. But now when you read the Bible, it's just a reminder of that which you already know. It's a reminder of that which you already know. Because the new thing you actually call new is you. Behold, I do a new thing. It shall spring forth. It shall not tarry. It's you. You are the news. You are the good news. You are the gospel. That's why when Paul understands that, he says you are a piece of you are written a piece of it. We need to commend no nothing to any man. But you are an epistle. Known and read by all men. Which we minister. You are ministered by us. You, you are the gospel. We preach you. We no longer even preach Christ. Why? Because he left a place there and dwelt in men. Mystery. So I can't preach Christ and separate you from Jesus. But how many men have separated you from Christ? But if Christ should raise a generation of men who are, who understand the epignosis, you realize that if the truth shall come infallible, that out of that man is the true line of a man who, like, has a household. And out of that household, out of him flows both new and old. That man will never seek God for a Sunday sermon. He will never seek God for a Thursday meeting line. Every time he gets on that pulpit, he will speak unction. Why? Because it flows out of a fullness in God. It doesn't flow out of parts that are added potentially by assembly. How could Paul preach every day? How could he preach every day and make tents? He stumbled on epignosis. He stumbled on epignosis. All he needed were just those moments in Arabia. You understand? For the man to bear reproach without the camp. Because Paul had dwelt around the camp long enough. The camp had an excitement but not according to revelation. Had a zeal but not according to knowledge. It, it had a certain line of what they call truth but cannot stand up to prove. Yet, is reasonably right. Because many men think as long as something is reasonably right, it's therefore true. If so, Abraham could not have lied that Sarah was his wife and God afflicted Pharaoh. He should have afflicted Abraham for lying. 
But there is the mind of God deeper than Abraham lying. By reason he wasn't right. But by God he was right. I also don't know how. Now there's a weak mind that says that means we can lie. I understand your doubt. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. So he gets the judistic life, okay? And then yesterday, some of you who are here, I explained something in Galatians, the experience of Galatians, okay? How God takes him to Arabia, brings him back, he spends three years in Damascus to the guys he first met, and then he left Damascus saying Jesus is the Lord. His only revelation was that Jesus, the Son of God, came. But by the time he comes from Arabia, he realizes there's some called the grace. Okay? He shares it with the guys in Damascus. He spends three years there. He goes to Jerusalem. We read the guy being in Judea. We read that he goes to Cilicia and Syria. You understand? Afterward, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And then he continued to preach the gospel. Okay? And was unknown by the first and to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. What was he doing? He now starts to share this. Okay? As Paul starts to share the new revelation the Lord had placed in him, something happened. Let's begin Galatians 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. Now the message had been understood to the Gentiles. And some of you remember the experience I shared in the book of Acts, where the Gentiles were preached. In fact, this is amazing. But for those of you who are with me reading the book of Acts yesterday, you realize Paul preached salvation to the Gentiles and never mentioned the law. Did we prove it yesterday in the scriptures? He never mentioned the law. But then, <laughs> amazingly, Peter himself tells you, we have seen the Lord work in Gentiles without the law. He worked in them without the law. He worked in them without the Ten Commandments. He didn't want don't kill, don't kill. It was deeper than them don't stealing, not killing. It was Paul putting God enough in them not to steal. And not needing, not to be told to steal. Because the one who didn't steal is in them. Do you get the preacher? Yes. Do you understand where I'm coming from? That's why I told a man. If only the new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, the old is passed and now the new. You cannot seek to raise a man not to do what he shouldn't do because the law tells him not to do it. If there is an easier way to make a man new and enter one who never knew sin. Now when the man is going to the full measure and the state of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and as he is now so are we in this world. How can you tell Jesus don't steal? Don't commit adultery. In the first place, he's an incorruptible seed that abideth and liveth forever. How can you tell what can't be corrupted not to be corrupted unless you don't believe in its incorruption? That's the spirit of Antichrist. Let's begin Galatians 2. 14 years then I went up to Jerusalem. Again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Give me the message version of that. And I went up. Okay, let's just finish with that. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which, preached, which I preached among the Gentiles. He has taken this message back to Jerusalem. Remember, the only two people that he had spoken to this message, he said he confided with no apostle except Peter. He spent 15 days in the house of Peter debating with him. He said, I went up to Peter in Jerusalem to compare stories. You remember that? And after that, when Peter believes the message, he comes in and tells, he tells him, you know what, tell the chief apostle James. So two people, James and Peter, understand. That's why later... When we see the line and experience of the house of Cornelius to speak, and later the, the Jewish believers who are still Judistic in school of thought, inclined to the fact that Gentiles, even with salvation, should circumcise themselves, you realize that Peter and James come in to fight for Paul because they had understood the message on Paul. So this is a message battle. It's not a church ministry institution battle. It is a message battle between a man who does not confide in flesh and blood because Hellenism had corrupted Judaism and the Lord separates him from the camp and throws him to the lands of Arabia to teach him the gospel. And he says, no flesh and blood taught me this. You get where I'm coming from? So he went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel. Now he's going to Jerusalem to tell them what he had taught the Gentiles. Which? I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run in vain. Why does he first go to the apostles then? He wants to first meet them and tell them, the Lord revealed to me that there is a righteousness that is besides the law. But what we know in the Judistic school of thought 
everything that is righteous must be in the law. That's why Paul was right in the Judaism line to say, concerning the righteousness which is of the law, I was blameless. But even that place where I'm blameless, with the righteousness which is in the law, I also counted that but done, that I might have an excellence in knowledge. And the excellence in knowledge was that even though there is a righteousness in the law, that I can be fulfilled under, it still doesn't give me salvation. Salvation begins with the righteousness of God imputed, that I've not worked for. And Paul count all that but what? But done. Now, imagine a man who was a former Judistic Hellenist, gone to Damascus, had experiences of preaching, thrown in Arabia, comes back with a new message, is sharing the things with the guys at Jerusalem. Peter and James have been told about it. Now he comes in full throttle to preach to these guys. He realizes if he stands in front and tells them about this message, there is going to be havoc. Because we remember the last contention in, 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 in Acts between the circumcision and uncircumcision. You remember it came out of the believers, the Bible says, the Pharisees who believed in Christ, but still beheld the doctrine of Judaism. You remember how hot that havoc was. You understand? So Paul wants to avoid havoc. What does he do? He goes to the man of reputation and tells him, you know what? There's this message of sin. Can we compare notes? Okay? Firstly, to them, our reputation. And that's the thing I learned about ministers. It doesn't matter how deep the message you carry is. First, submit it to an authority. Where you're going to preach. If the man tells you, I don't believe in the grace message, you ask him, what do you believe in? He tells you, I believe in faith. Preach faith. Make the lame walk open blind eyes and raise the dead. Go and move. Preach faith until faith is enough to produce grace. So it can only be of faith that it will be of grace. Don't become too adamant to say, for me, the Lord told me whether they want it or not, I'm going to preach the grace, and then you split ministries. That's offense to Christ. Because you've made a weaker brother stumble by what you eat. Hallelujah. Let's continue. To privately, to them that are reputation. Give them a message, Basil. Hmm. I want to clarify with them what I had been revealed to me. This is Paul saying. At that time, I pleased before them exactly what was I was preaching to the non-Jews. Okay? I did this in private with the leaders, those that, held, that were held in esteem by the church, so that our concern would not become a controversial public issue, marred by ethnic tensions, exposing my years of work to denigration and endangering my present ministry. He knew it would bring some controversy. Next line. Significantly, Titus, non-Jewish though, was not required to be circumcised. Okay, next line. While we were in conference, we were infiltrated by spies. We were infiltrated by spies. And the Bible says they were pretending to be what? Christian. Who slipped in to find out how, just how free true Christians are? The ulterior motive was to reduce us to their brand of Savitude, because they were bound Judas. And Paul was preaching a message of freedom. Okay? Next slide. We didn't give them the time of the day and we were determined to preserve the truth of the message too for you. That means Paul did not do it. He, he didn't fight for himself. No. He fought for the sake of those ones who must know the message. That's what we do. We fight for those ignorant people who you're playing with because they're ignorant. But we don't fight for ourselves. No. We're already guarded. Shababa. Tell your neighbor, Shababa. Next line. As for those who are considered important in the church, their reputation doesn't concern me. God doesn't be impressed with mere appearances. And neither am I. And of course, these leaders were able to add nothing to the message I had been preaching. Let's continue. It was soon evident that God had entrusted me with the same message to the non-Jews as Peter had been preaching to the Jews. So realize, Paul understands that Peter is given a message to the Jews and for him it's the non-Jews. Remember in, in the church at Jerusalem, when contentions come of circumcision for salvation, Peter can stand and they listen to him. He was older than James, even though James was the chief apostle. So he had a certain way he could get in the hearts of the Jewish people that Paul couldn't. Why? Because Paul had a root of the diaspora. He was raised with the Greek guys. Take him to culture, he tells you he was wiser than his peers. He was a sharp guy. Are you understanding me? Deep in the Hellenistic, he understood the Greek culture. God could only have used the man who knew where it was. That's why he takes you in Guru or Arua, because he trusts you can do something there. That's why the moment after conversion, he goes to Cilicia. That's why I have a problem with men who are anointed in Uganda to go and preach in America. No, first leave a testimony in, in Uganda. Enough for you to go and preach in America. That the evidence is in Jerusalem, full. Judea, full. Samaria, full. And the most parts of the world, full. But you're leaving Kampala without even a kachach. Without even a room of people praying, and you skip into the United States of America, because the Lord called you in the United States of America. 
And they have this feeling that if they won't go to America, they'll never be rich. You're bound. Next line. <laughs> Recognizing that my calling had been given by God. James, remember the guy he told you? Peter and John. That means in a certain council, James and Peter could have told John and said, man, Paul has a message. Paul has a message. The Bible says, they shook hands with me and Barnabas had assigned us to a ministry of the non-Jews while we continued the responsibility of reaching out to the Jews. The right hand of fellowship. In fact, that's koinonia, communion. Communion stops to be just a place where we pray together. But communion starts to also have a place of the apostolic to establish men in what grace they are given. We are in a meeting, yes, I'm praying. But I want to find out whether you have a grace in university so I can send you there. I'm not just listening to you to get excited and, and steal your notes to go and preach them. Ah. Next line. The only additional thing they asked was that we remember the poor. And I was already ready either. We, we were ready. Huh? Let's continue. Later, when Peter came to Antioch, I had a face-to-face -face confrontation with him because he was clearly out of line. Let's continue. Here is the situation. Earlier before, certain persons had come from James, Peter, and regularly ate with the non-Jews. You understand? Why? James and Peter had understood the message. Tell anybody they had understood the message. So they could also come in and start to eat with the non-Jews because there was a law that could not even allow the Jews to eat with the non-Jews. But now they started to come in. You understand? But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique. And that's been pushing the old system of circumcision. You understand? They were trying to come in. Peter and James had said to tell them, let's, you know, encourage these guys. But they still had the, the doctrine of Judaism was still inside their spirit. You understand? And so they have a certain system where they still hold the law. Peter sees men in the law. He hides the name. He fearfully does what? He goes. Next line. And fortunately, the rest of the Jews in the Antioch church joined in that hypocrisy. So that even Barnabas was swept along in the chariot. Okay? Even Barnabas was, eh. He also, because he saw guys of the law, they are trying to be sent. I know James and Peter is meaning right, are meaning right to send these guys to go and mingle with the non-Jewish. But the guys they are sending are still legal. And they remember these guys, they have an issue of circumcision. And these guys know the law of not eating with non-Jews. And when Peter, Barnabas, and a few Jews see, they separate themselves. Yet they were eating with them. You understand? You see, if you're not Jewish, and you don't understand the grace, I don't understand you. Because it's the grace that actually allowed you to eat with a Jewish guy. You could not have shared a place. Uh -huh, let's continue. But when I saw that they were not maintaining a steady and straight course according to the message, Paul is trying to speak of a particular message. And in a few minutes I'm going to prove it, okay? I'm going to prove it. He says, I spoke up to Peter in front of them all and said, If you are Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by the watchdogs from Jerusalem. What right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to the Jewish customs just to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem cronies? How do you expect them? If, 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 if you're, you're, when, when the Jews come, you act like you're under the law. I mean, and the Gentiles see you. How do, they, how do they expect them to trust you and trust your system that segregates them? You got where I'm coming from? Next slide. We Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. Already that's a problem with Paul's statement. Because many Jews think they have an added advantage. Like a few cultures up to today still think they're better than black men. They still feel they're better. But this guy says, we Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We don't. In the grace dispensation, that, that nonsense ain't there. It ain't there. You can't understand the grace and, and your father tells you don't marry Musoga. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither Musoga or Mushiga. Let's continue. We know very well, listen to, to Paul. Ah. God, you're going to realize that men don't read the Bible. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping. That we are through only personal faith in Jesus Christ. Not through keeping rules. No, no, no. You understand? He says, 
Read also the King James. You realize it's the same language. I'm trying, just trying to simplify it by a message. I have read and realized that it's so related with the King James, but would simplify those of you who have grammar issues. I'm probably need to understand to a deeper sense. If you want to know, let's go to the King James. Just give me the King James. You realize that the King James says the same thing. What does it say? Ba -ba 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 -ba. One, two, three, go. Uh -huh. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law. This guy was even more blatant here. You're not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Is that so? So take me back to the message. So he says, how do we know that we are not set free by keeping a set of rules but by faith in Christ? He says, we tried it. Listen to men who tried it. We tried it and we have the best system of rules the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah. Not trying to be good. They, they have the best system in the world. They have the best system. If you want to talk about the best system of rule keeping, they have the rules, they have the laws of Moses, the oral laws, the things the priests had also established as that added laws. You understand? They have the best system in the world. But even with the best system, up to today, there is no revival in Jerusalem. Up to today, there is no gospel in Jerusalem. It's in you black guys. It's in United States, Australia, America, Canada. It's not in Jerusalem. Yet they have the best system. What am I trying to tell you? The system can't sustain church. The person does. Let's continue. Let's continue. Have some of you noticed, ah, I love Paul, that we are not yet perfect? Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? Have you noticed? Give me the King James of that. So that some people don't say, ah, he's missed. Uh, 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 what I say? But if why we seek to be justified by Christ, you understand? But if why we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is that for Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He is actually saying there is a place where we seek to be justified, but we still have issues. The issues are there. Even the men who say they are the most perfect, they also have issues. Do you agree? Let's go back to the Amplified. I mean a message. He says it's no great surprise that men are not yet perfect. And are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me, who go through Christ in order to get things right with God, I am perfectly virtuous. Christ therefore must have been an accessory to sin. That accusation is frivolous. They got to a point where men were looking at Paul who has refused to obey the Ten Commandments but has allowed to enter Jesus Christ because he believes he tried the line of the Ten Commandments and failed so he entered a man who could help him do it and when they see this man doing it through Paul they have a problem and start to accuse him and say ha that line where there is no law there must be sin there are men who think that where there are no commandments there are no sin can we expedite that? the Bible says <laughs> Where there is no law, there is no transgression. And that's the thing the world has taught very differently. Romans 4.15. <laughs> Let's read. One, two, three, go. Uh -huh. uh. Now, if the Bible says where there is no law, men don't transgress. Why do some men tell us that where there is no law, men transgress? Which gospel are they preaching? These men used to say, there are men in the campuses who are preaching a gospel and they're not talking about the law of our Lord. And I'm asking, if the Bible says where there is no law, there is no transgression, what is the implication? It means wherever there is law, there is transgression. That's what the Bible says, the law was added for transgression. Am I lying? Isn't that your Bible? Isn't that your Bible? Do you know many people think that when you have a lawless society, they think that that society will become chaos or chaotic let me correct you the mind of god says where there is no law men don't become funny i'm only trying to say to the mind of god not to the mind of men to the mind of men it's putting us in order look at men like abraham they didn't know the law but did abraham go to heaven that's why paul tells you that i was alive once without the law i think it's romans 7 he says, one time without the law, I was alive. 
But when the law came, sin revived and I died. There was a time, it's there, you read it, write it in your Bible. Red and color, bold and align it. It says, I was alive without the law. Let me ask, simple English, is it possible for a man to be alive without the law? Is it possible for a man to go to heaven without the law? There are certain men, when they hear that, they become crazy. Why? Because they're judistic. Moses is their prophet, not Jesus. The seventh creed of the judistic line says, Moses was the wisest man there was and will ever live. That means if you're talking of Jesus, to us he has even not yet come. So if they say Moses is the wisest man, to them anything that is not the law cannot establish the church. One time a very prominent man said, and I still quote him, he said, where there are no laws, or where there is no law in the church, that church is not of Christ. I laughed. I laughed. And this man has been preaching this gospel for more than 30 years, and is a celebrated teacher of the gospel in Uganda, an apostle. And he doesn't know that men were alive once without the law. And he said, that a church without the Ten Commandments cannot stand. And grace ministers are removing the Ten Commandments. Listen, grace ministers are not removing the Ten Commandments out of church. No. They are establishing the Ten Commandments. Because they are preaching one who established and completed them. Moses never fulfilled the law. He says, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So that's the power of the commandment. What's the instance of the law? To revive sin and you die. So, how do you get life again? Remove what revives sin. Sin dies. And then you are alive. I'll preach that soon. I'll explain the concept. Hallelujah. So let's go back to the story. Back to Galatians. Eh? He says, if I was trying to be good, this is Paul saying, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. If I'm trying to be good, I will be doing the thing, this law. Because let me tell you the principle Paul introduced in church. Don't try to be good. Don't try not to speak, sleep around. Don't try not to take drugs. Don't try not to tell lies. Because you will lie. You're establishing an old system. Enter one who did, never, who, who did not do your life. Enter one who never knew no sin. Enter one who never even, who was tempted in all ways. The Bible says, but he did what? He sinned not. Why? You see, the difference between Christ and many, these other men that follow after the pattern of Christ, Melchizedek, this man, one, it was simple. He did no sin. You could bring sin and he doesn't know it. That's what the Bible says. He that knew no sin. He didn't do no sin. He, in the first place, didn't even know it. And that's the only way you can walk. Walk in a place where you don't even know how to steal. You won't need for a man to tell you don't steal. It's like, it's like a person who doesn't know how to drive a car. And he's told, don't drive my car. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I already don't know how to drive. How can you say, don't drive my car? But all the, the guys in the law want to learn how to drive and try not to drive it. Man. <laughs> Sin will take advantage because you know it's fun. Okay, let's continue. I'll be rebuilding the same what? Uh uh. Go take me back. The same old system that I tore down. I'll be acting as a what? Chatterley. Now read the next line. You're going to even laugh. What actually took place is this I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be. I tried. Now, some of you have not even yet tried like Paul. Because you are no Pharisee. You don't even understand Judaism. And a man who tried failed, and you're trying what Paul failed. Or teaching what Paul failed. Let's continue. Christ's life showed me how, and enabled me to do it. That's the principle of the grace message. Huh? You know, that, that, and that's why some men are fighting us. You know why? Because it has removed every authority and power and pride they had over people. They have this line of, I'm the one who brought you. 
I'm the one who pushed you out of sea. I'm the one who clothed you. I'm the one. You see, they became mediators of a new covenant. <laughs> they became gods. Catch my hunky. Catch my. Don't touch me. Clean my shoe. Wash my dog. Open the car. I'm a girl. You sit in the car. Bodyguards. Guard me. I'm the only man of God. I am higher. I am. Kiss my ring. Kiss it. Kiss it. Kiss it. I'm the vicar of Christ. Kiss it. I'm the only man that can. The vicar of Christ. The carrier of Philly Bay. The vicar of Christ can't even make lame men walk. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Christ life showed me how. Tell your neighbor, Christ life showed me how. I identified myself completely. And that's the principle about the grace. Identify yourself with Christ. I am like Christ. And this is love made perfect that we might have confidence in that day. For as he is, so are we in this world. Be like Christ. Think you are Christ. Believe you are Christ. Don't try to be like Christ. No. Remember the fivefold ministry is working for this one thing. To perfect you. To be like the one Paul is telling you to think like you are him. I don't know whether you understand the English. If you don't, don't worry. Even me, I don't. In, indeed, I've been crucified. Shababa. I've been crucified. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear before you all have good opinion. I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who believed me. This is Paul talking to Peter and all these other guys who are acting hypocritical. I believe even some bunch of, of, of circumcision guys were there. So you know what he's doing. Let's continue. I'm not going to go back on that. It is, is it not clear that, is it not clear to you that to go back to that old rule keeping peer pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God? Don't you realize it? Don't you realize it? He says, I refuse. Tell your neighbor, I refuse. I say it. I want to see your mouth. One, two, three, go. I refuse to what? Yeah. To repudiate God's grace. I refuse to repudiate God's grace. If you didn't say it, you're not going to heaven. Okay, I give you another chance. One, two, three, go. I refuse to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. He shouldn't have died. He should have left me and I stayed keeping my rules because that's the way God can change. Why did Jesus come? Because I failed to keep the rules. Next line. You crazy Galatians. Now he's quarreling. You crazy Galatians. Who put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened to you. It is obvious that you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus of your life. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. Next line. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or it was by responding to what God's message did to you? You see that? That's the thing of the grace. You don't do too much for God to respond to you. God does something for you to respond to. We respond to what Christ did. Christ does not. We don't do much for God to respond to us. That's the old system. The old system tells you, pray, God will anoint you. For us, we pray because the anointed us. What a lover! I want something godly. We have been given all things that pertain to life. Godliness. We have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. In this camp, the grace guys, we believe we have. In the camp of the legal guys, they don't have. They're working their heads off to get. So when that man goes to prayer mountain, he goes to seek God. When I go to prayer mountain, I go with God to talk. You don't understand what I mean. I don't go to prayer mountain to meet God. I go to prayer mountain to be with God. 
I, I found one time a guy at the prayer mountain and he was he wanted God to give him an anointing, to increase his anointing. I told the brother, just raise your hands. I have this treasure in Athens vessels. I don't know. Woo! Right, that's why we're preaching deeper than mountain guys. We're reaching out deeper than mountain guys. We're healing deeper than mountain guys. We're doing more results than mountain guys. Because the time shall come where you shall not worship the old God in what mountain or that mountain or Seguku mountain. He says, for them that worship the Lord shall worship him in spirit and truth. There is a place in the spirit that can create a mountain in Mukono. Oh, by faith, you shall speak to this mountain. By a mouth, the in Mukono. And nothing shall be possible with you. If he said I can move mountains, I don't need to go to Seguku. I can get Seguku in my room. Oh! 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 I'm in my bedroom, but I'm bathing on Seguku Mountain. So <laughs> the man thinks. given all things that pertain to life and godliness. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not we shall be blessed if we keep rules. Not we might be blessed. Listen. Let me tell you what the grace message says. You're rich. You're not typing to be rich. You're typing because you're rich. You understand where I'm coming from? The way you're walking, you're walking because you're married. You're not walking to get married. You get what I'm trying to tell you. You're not... You are married. That's why you're walking like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to tell you. You're, you're, you are. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, don't try to walk for men to see you and marry you. No. Walk because you're married. Because he didn't say he that finds a woman. He said he that finds a wife. It must find you a wife. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. It must find you a wife. Not a woman. Because in Christ all things are yeah. Now. You don't try to read hard to be the best doctor. You read hard because you're the best doctor. You understand what I'm saying? You don't revise to get to be the best engineer. You revise because you're ready to head. I don't give to get money. I give because I'm rich. Oh, shit. Let's finish this. Let me show you how bewitched the Galatians were. Was it by working your heads up to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? How was it? Answer me, how was it? So, do you know that the most dangerous line of witchcraft is done by men who act to be Christian. I'll tell you why. Let's go back to Genesis, G G Galatians, verse, first verse. You foolish Galatians, give me the King James. Give me the King James. Who bewitched? Paul says, Baba Loga. It's not, a, it's not funny, it's serious. Paul says, who did what? Who bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth and crucified among you. Next line. King James. This only outline of you. Receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith. How did you receive it? So, if you're bewitched, it means certain men convinced you to think that you received the spirit by working out the law, not by the hearing of faith. So, any man that preaches to a man the way of the spirit through the law and not through faith is actually bewitching. That's witchcraft. Why? The Bible says very clearly, witchcraft is as rebellion. Let me show you which doctors. Witchcraft is as rebellion. Witchcraft is as what? Do you know that witchcraft is as rebellion? Do you believe that witchcraft is as rebellion? Where is it? He says, uh-huh. For rebellion. One, two, three, go. For? It's as witchcraft. And stubbornness as iniquity. 
There are certain men that have rebelled from the righteousness of God. And those men are weak as. Because they've refused. They've rebelled. Romans 10 verse 1. What does it say? Romans 10 verse 1. Let me show you. Brethren, my heart's desires and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them a record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Let me show you how, 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 how they've rebelled. Next slide. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What are they being? They're rebellious. And rebellion is as witchcraft. And these witches are preaching. And as they are preaching, they are bewitching. So when Paul is talking about witchcraft, he's not talking about the guy doing juju. No. He's talking about men teaching. Things that become witchcraft are not sound doctrine. Let's finish with Galatians. We shall come back to the righteousness of God next Saturday. I want to show you the doctrine of Antioch, okay? I just want to take only three or five minutes and finish. I'm sorry, it's that hard, but it's the truth. Take it or leave it. Are you so foolish? He's abusing. And the Galatians are all quiet. Even Peter, who is ashamed now. <laughs> you see, I'm imagining. Even Barnabas is like this. Paul is abusing. Are you foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect to, in the flesh? Message version. Message version. Having begun in the spirit. Are you crazy going to continue craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't, listen, question. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough not to begin it, how do you suppose? If when you are not born again, you could not stop sleeping around, how do you expect to stop sleeping around on your own without Christ? You're bewitched. Somebody convinced you so. Next slide. Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? It is not yet a total loss, but suddenly will be if you keep this up. You continue. Next slide. Answer this question. Does God, sir, who lavishly provides you with his own presence, his Holy Spirit, working things in your life you could never do for yourself, does he do these things because of your strenuous moral striving? Or because you trust in him to do it. It answers the same question of a man of God who asked me. A man of God told me, I've seen men who are sleeping around and killing, but they can demonstrate the spirit. Simple. Very simple. They didn't receive the spirit because they were morally upright. They received the spirit because they believed. And now there are certain men who think they'll receive the spirit by living morally upright. And what happened? They're morally upright but not anointed. And because they're not anointed, they become envious of the anointed, and then they start to criticize the weaknesses of the anointed because they think that the weaknesses of the anointed are disqualifying the anointed or that the anointed are intending to sin. No man born of God can deliberately sin. And who are you, man of God, to judge another man's servant? He says, for if that servant falls, he falls before God. I'm telling you scripture. I'm not telling you anything out of scripture. He says, if that man falls, he falls before God. And if he stands, he stands before God. And I'll tell you something. Yeah, God is able to make that man stand. Listen, learn this. Men don't fall before you. Men fall before God. Men are not your servants. They're servants of God. And trust me, even that man who is still adulterating, God will get him back in the kingdom. He will clean him and use him for his glory. If that God worked on David, he can work on any man. Now, when you say you don't receive this by the law, certain religious men start to think you're saying it's okay to sin. Yes, that's what they say. Right as Romans 3, 8 say. He says, many are slanderously reporting and they are affirming that we are saying that you should do evil so good should come. Because every time you mention that, they don't understand that we are trying to establish men to believe right such that they can live right. For them, they think we are providing license to sin. Why? Because they don't understand the other side of the finished work. That's why he says, many... Romans 3, 8, and not rather as be slanderously reported as some have found that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Let me tell you something. Paul preached a message that if you hear it, you'd think he's saying it's okay to sin. But to the men who understood it, you realize, and I'll tell you this truth, you will realize this one truth, that Gentiles never continued in sin. Yet, the men who claim this 
are the Jews who were illegal and stayed in sin. And the church of Jerusalem died. Do you see the irony? Don't these things happen among you just as they happened with Abraham? He believed God. And that act of belief was turned into a life that was right with God. Do you realize that? Just believe in God. He will produce a life that lives right. But these men say you don't just believe. You also have to do something. No. Do nothing. Only believe. That's why next Saturday I will explain the works. Some people are saying, faith without works is dead. Stupid. Read the works. What might we do that we might do the works of God? This is... So are you talking of works not stealing or works the works of faith to believe? Anyway, you'll understand this. Sons of Abraham, listen. It was turned into a life of what? That was right with God. Imagine. This is what the grace says. Believe in Jesus, you'll stop sleeping around. The law says, stop sleeping around, Jesus will be happy with you. So funny. Let's continue. Is it not obvious to you that persons who put their trust in Jesus, in Christ, not persons who put their trust in the law, are like Abraham, children of faith. Isn't it obvious that we don't put our trust in the law, we put our trust in Christ? Don't we become children of Abraham? What does Abraham represent? Faith. Next slide. It was all laid out beforehand in Scripture that God would set things right with non-Jews by faith. Scripture anticipated this. Even the Scriptures anticipated. They, they were writing them and they also saw it. <laughs> uh, now, if the Scriptures saw it, how about you, black guy? You understand? All nations will be blessed in you. Next slide. So those now who live by faith are blessed along with Abraham who lived by faith. This is no new doctrine. It's not new. You, you think it's a new doctrine in the church. It's the oldest. It's older than Moses. Next slide. So, those now who live by faith are blessed alone. Okay? Answer this question. Does the God who lavishly uh, working things in your life, could he ever do it? Uh uh. Okay. And that means, listen, that anyone who tries to live by his own effort, independent of God, is doomed to failure. Scripture hacks this up. Utterly cursed is every person who fails to carry out every detail written in the book of the law. So you actually attract curses when you're under the law. Because you refuse who became a curse. Next line. The obvious impossibility of carrying out such a moral program should make it plain that no one can sustain a relationship with God that way. The person who lives in right relationship with God does it by embracing what God arranges for him. Doing things for God is the opposite of entering into what God does for you. Habakkuk had it right. The person who believes God is set right by God. And that is real life. Don't try to carry a relationship by keeping a moral program. I will not steal. I will not sleep around. I will not lie. I swear you won't get God. Enter him. He will walk in you. Next line. Rule keeping. Huh. One, two, three, go. Uh -huh. Read. Uh, does not naturally evolve into living by faith but only perpetuates itself in more and more rule keeping a fact observed in scripture the one who does these things rule keeping continues to live in them you just continue keeping more rules and then you become a slave next line christ redeemed us oh one two three go from that self-defeating cast life by absorbing it completely into himself do you remember the scripture cast that is what when jesus was nailed he became and at the same time a curse so are you under any curse next line and now because of that one two three go the error is and we can now that abraham's blessing is present and available for ugandans too we are all able to receive god's life his spirit in and with us by believing just the way abraham believed you tell your neighbor to be continued next saturday raise your hands and speak in other tongues i'm blessed i'm blessed i'm blessed 
I'm blessed, oh, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Raise your hands, I want to speak a blessing upon you. I decree and declare as a servant of God that the Lord works in you that you're not under the law but you're under grace that you're not under rule keeping but under one who kept all the rules that you're more than a conqueror by Christ who strengthens you that you're blessed going in and blood going out that kings shall come to your rising that in all you do you shall prosper you'll prosper in your businesses you'll prosper in your institutions you'll prosper in your university you'll prosper in your workplace you prosper in your profession. You prosper in your marriage. You prosper in your ministry. Everywhere you will be, you will be a bright shining light. Your children shall be present. Your family shall be blessed. Anybody related to you, the reason of being related to you, shall be blessed. Because you are blessed to be a blessing. And so the multiplying is shall multiply you. You shall eat the good of the land in the name of Jesus Christ. Blood and water shall not leave your household. The anointing shall never leave your heart. His presence shall anoint you. It shall endorse you. It shall support you. It shall crown you. His love will encroach in you. Marriage shall be a person. Deliverance shall be a story. Understanding will be a testimony. Wisdom shall be a life. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Give the Lord a mighty hand of applause. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero. Make manifest.